All right, everybody, welcome back to the Backwards Podcast. I'm your host, AJ Giuliani, and I am here today with somebody who I've wanted to get on the podcast for a long time. We just happen to be very difficult at being able to connect with each other. But here we are <laughs> finally connecting each other. I'm with John Carippo, and we're going to be talking about all things edgy protocols, how right now in this moment we're using ed tech and what this looks like for engagement and empowerment. And like always on the Backwards Podcast, we're going to dive into John's story first. I have to tell you. Okay. <laughs> it, it may start when he was five years old, because I already got a sneak peek when we were talking a little bit before, but uh, I'm interested, John, if you could just share with everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got to the place you are now, which is working with people all around the country, all around the globe on engaging and empowering students. How, how'd you get there? Tell us your story. Oh, I will tell you, uh, K-12 was 2.9 GPA guy right here. All right. Like every report card I had says John doesn't apply himself. <laughs> Everyone. And so God was preparing me <laughs> for, for helping to uh, create empathy, really. And then I played a little football in college. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to be a graduate assistant uh, for a guy named Jim Sweeney at Fresno State. And he taught us a lot about two things, brain science and Asian strategy uh, via the ancient Chinese general Sun Tzu. Oh yeah, and he he really put a lot of yeah, and 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 in college, and at no time was I planning on being a teacher, but I'm amassing all of these experiences, right? I do this and I do this. Also, my major was advertising, so I'm used to when I look at thirty people, like as when I put my teacher hat on too tight, I look at thirty people and I think these people all live in my zip code and they have to be in my school, right? But when I've got my advertising hat on, I'm like I'm thinking. How can I turn 30 people into 33 people because they like my product so much? So there's a, a slightly different essence there. Oh, that kid's a transfer. Is he going to transfer out? Because if he transfers out, that means he's not digging what I'm buying. Right. So like my, my DNA of that is different than a classic teacher DNA, which, you know, we got a bad habit from a lot of our college professors. I'm going to be mean until the class gets to be a size I like. And that's just not a very good plan in public school because people are here by zip code. They didn't pay me 20000 to be yes. here, right? So mix all that up. Mix all that up. And then I meet this hot girl named Rhonda, and she takes me to weddings for like six months to a year uh, as we're dating. And I keep having to sit next to her high school cheerleading coach, who's now an assistant superintendent. And so we just start shooting the breeze. And after about five weddings, he's like, bro, you're a teacher. Let's go. And literally within three days, I knew I, I was like, this is what I do, bro. This is my jam. And again, a kind of a God thing. I realized all the years of kind of sucking at being a student gave me empathy yeah. for what it's like to be really bored. Mm -hmm. And this is back in the days when we didn't have air conditioning in the room. And uh, man, it was a big day. If you had a color of a uh, pen other than black, right. like we didn't have staplers. It was the old days, right? So for me, I always try to channel a little bit of Jack Black in my classroom. Like, like it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a great day. We're going to enjoy ourselves. So I got into teaching and I spent about four years under the spell of Harry Wong, which actually did a lot of damage to me. Um, his book, the, the, the First Days of School, like I'm going to be straight right now. 98% uh, of the book is dead on. But the 2%, like, AJ, if I said, I'm going to give you a banana split right now, and there's some fly in it. Right. How much, how much fly before you don't want it? Like, yeah, most okay. people don't fly. <laughs> so it's a really good book. It's like a banana split of teaching, but there's a little fly in it. And here's the problem. And, and it's not Harry's fault. It comes from a different time. When I played football in the 70s, there were two main things they yelled at games. Walk it off. Can you imagine that nowadays? <laughs> no, they call a freaking helicopter now. Same thing with me. <laughs> I was and there. Then, and then they would say, don't drink water, you'll cramp. Oh, yeah. Well, that was pretty bad advice. <laughs> um, now I have kids at the mall who have been away from home for 12 minutes, and they're like, mom, I need to hydrate. I need to hydrate. So, so when Harry wrote the book, it was a different time. What I realized is that it's possible to read that book and come away with the idea that procedures are more important 
than the relationship with the child. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, anybody's listening, nothing comes before your interpersonal relationship with the child. Um, for your listeners that don't know, I was an assistant superintendent. I was an executive director of a, a top five educational nonprofit in the in the country, and I fired myself and I went back to the classroom two years ago. Yeah. And I didn't tell you this when we were in the green room. And by the way, thanks for the snacks, delicious. <laughs> um, when I the, literally the first day, AJ, I started up my my Zoom the first day because I'm doing this in the middle of COVID, and I had this epiphany, and I told the kids. I'm going to be at your wedding. I love it. And they're like, what? I'm in sixth grade. I go, yeah, dude, I'm just telling you, uh, 12 to 17 years from now, an invite's going to show up. Yep. And I'm going to be at your wedding eating chicken and rice with everybody else. <laughs> uh, I'm going to meet your kids coming out of the Target in between 18 and 20 years from now. You're going to be like, oh, this is my daughter, Shane, my daughter. And my, and my son, Bo, I go, bro, I've been teaching for 25 years. I know what the other end of this rainbow looks like. I'm going to see you at football games. I'm going to see you at movies. You're going to ask me, which MacBook should I buy? Is the iPhone 23 really good? Yeah. This is what happens when we hang out for 180 days. Like, I don't need more friends. But when you hang out with people for an extended period of time, you become deeper friends. And I want to let you know that I'm here if you need me for the rest of your life. And I don't need friends. I'm not a stalker. I have personal friends. It's cool. But I said, uh, I've, I've adopted one of you in the past. And I've done, I've been the priest at three weddings and I'm not a priest. And I think that really made an impact on the kids because they're like, this is not just a, a one year thing. This is not just a passing by. So there's kind of my origin story. Um, I love there's it. a whole bunch of other backwaters we can get into, but I, I don't want to tear up the whole time on all my weird no, life stories. I, I love it for so many reasons. And I, I do want to dive into you going back into the classroom. Um, specifically, you went back in a time where I think we needed teachers. It was during COVID. Mm -hmm. We needed uh, not just teachers, but also teachers with teaching with ed tech tools, teaching online, experience, that type of thing. What made you really decide to jump back into the classroom? Like, like you're, you're having that yeah. conversation, that process. What, what did that look like? I can tell you the exact moment that it happened. I was, I was heading back from a gig I, did, I had done in Australia. I was somewhere over the Pacific Ocean at about three in the morning. And I thought to myself, self, I would give myself a, a very high B, very low A for leadership. I could just do this for the next six years and I'm good and I retired. And then I said, but is that what I want to do when I wake up in the morning? And I said, no, you know what I really like is I really like pedagogy. I really like teaching teachers how to teach. And as long as I'm doing this admin thing, that's going to be a sidebar. Right. And so what I did was I said, how do I, how do I get myself out of the administrative slash leadership rat race? Cause you've been in it. Like, oh, yeah, it's like a bottomless pit, make more money, lose more time. So you need more money to pay, make up for time and then make more money. So you can go on vacation and all that stuff. Right. It's just, it's a rat race and uh, heads up to teachers. If you're not aware, principals don't make more money than you. They work another 75 days, same daily rate. <laughs> Check out the math sometime. It's not that great. So, I said, okay, John, so if it's a clean slate and I like teaching teachers, what's that look like? So I decided if I'm going to presume to tell teachers what we're doing, I need to be good at it. And so I never want to be the guy that stands in front of people and go, I haven't been in a classroom since 87. Yeah. So uh, I said, okay, I got to find me a teaching gig somewhere that'll allow me to do some side work because, you know, I, I could lose some income, but it could, there's, there's a point where Mrs. Krupa would notice. So went back to the classroom, set up a thing with my district where I could have 10 release days to help augment my, my uh, pay and just kind of went whole hog edgy protocols on everything. And, and that was just the greatest year ever. I invented about five brand new protocols and all of them came out of pure desperation. AJ, it was like three fifteen Friday night. I'm like, I need something for Monday. And I don't know if you have this kind of mom or grandma, but you can literally give her a pile of flour and some bacon grease and she can make a cheesecake out of that. <laughs> and 
And I was just, I was just grandma on it. I was like, okay, well, if I did this and I did that, I don't have to do any planning Sunday. And I will be on a, a couple of them blocked. Not a lot, but a few did. I tried to have kids do, I'd seen people do a double state report. So you do the state you pick and the state I assign. And I really liked that because the comparing piece. Right. And I said to myself, I'm a super good teacher. Let's do a triple country report. We'll do India, Mesoamerica, and China at the same time. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was so bad. I literally told the kids, okay, just stop wherever you're at. That's an A. We're done. Those five days gone. We're just going to call that an A. We're out of here. Good. Moving on. Ancient civilization. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, so you get back in I'll, the classroom, though, right? You get back in the classroom. Yeah. And yeah. The one thing that you're talking about, and you're mentioning, which maybe I think most people that know you know, but maybe people don't, you mentioned this word edgy protocols. And right. this is something that you've written books on. You obviously talk and do a lot. And you were just talking about how in the classroom you were going full bore edgy protocols. What's an edgy protocol? What does that look like? You know, so explain it to us in layman's terms. It's on the one hand, it's super easy. And on the one hand, it's super hard. Yeah. Um, the super easy part is, um, and, and we didn't pre-show this either uh, in, in the green room. So uh, AJ, what grade level is, is, is a Venn diagram useful in? I was going to say a lot of grade levels. Yeah. What subject? A lot of subjects. How many times can you do it until it's you know, completely perfected and useless? Like forever right you can, do, you can do that for visa cards what yeah. tv should i binge what show next right you won't do it. so in its simplest sense a protocol is like a venn diagram type of thing it's a it's a thinking map i've heard people say that but it 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 doesn't require technology but it's better with technology like almost all the protocols will work on paper uh the only big problem with doing them on paper is they're hard to share Right. And there, and then you have to collect papers again. But protocols are also like a methodology of engaging students. Yes. Protocols are a way of giving students feedback. So it's kind of like, it's like a whole mindset thing. But the gateway drug that we call it, uh, <laughs> the gateway entry level drug is what we call fast and curious. So here's another little vignette. Yep. Uh, how many times, AJ, have you heard a teacher use this phrasing? We reviewed for the test with Kahoot. Many, many times. We reviewed for the test with GimKit or BlueKit. Okay. So here's what I did last year or, or year before last. So we did Latin roots. There was no word wall. There was no word search. There was no crossword. There was no write 15 horrible sentences that I don't want to read and over the weekend. We we would drop the words into GimKit, and we would play for about three to five minutes on the 15 words, and then I would give the kids feedback, and then uh, that would take about one minute, and then we would play again immediately, and we would do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then on Thursday, we were usually at about 85%, and I said, okay, let's go one last round, and if the class average is above 90 We'll stop, you'll get an A, and then we can play the fun one tomorrow. So like in GimKit, we could play uh, Among Us or one of the fun ones. And all I'm doing is giving them one more rep, big dummies. Uh, <laughs> so we start doing that. And remember, there's no packet. And this blows people's minds. I'm not reviewing with Blookit. I'm not reviewing with Quizlet. That is the memorizing piece. And then teachers will say, what aren't they memorizing? And to which I say, I've been waiting 25 years for kids to memorize. So yeah, <laughs> uh, fraction to decimal, decimal to fraction, uh, math facts. Yeah, that's memorizing. If I want to do concepts, I'll do a different protocol like a Freyer or an Iron Chef. So there's about 70 official protocols. But basically, it's a way of doing things over and over again that allows you to give kids real-time feedback. So you never end up with a stack of papers. You're preventing failure. And then I'll just wrap up that little portion with this. I had a student, four teachers came to me before he hit my classroom and they said, oh, you have so-and-so, he won't do anything. And that was based on last year. Four teachers. First thing they said to me, oh, I heard you got so-and-so. He won't do anything. Guess what that dude did 
at Christmas, right at, right before Christmas break, we had the Latin root cumulative final. There were 45 questions. Okay, that's a pretty big bite for a lot of sixth graders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I gave them 12 minutes. That dude did 135 questions because he just kept going. Wow. He only missed five. Wow. He basically took the final three plus times and only missed five. Oh, that's the same guy that they said wouldn't do anything, who, by the way, was a SPED student in the first percentile. Those are mind blowing shift. At his IEP in March, AJ, his mom said for the first time in his life, he's begun advocating for himself with his siblings. And he has six siblings. That is a big development when you have six yes. siblings. Yes. So to me, that's like the highest level of education where I've taken a student who was claimed to do nothing. Yeah. Oh, by the way, he beat the entire class by $4,000 in Yim Kid. He destroyed them. And they were fast. I couldn't beat them. And he took them down. Love it. At the end of the year, he was 54th percentile in math. He started the year at first percentile in math. So that was really the power of going back for that one year is picking up one group of kids and doing the full, the yeah. full uh, Gandalf on them, the whole routine. It was really cool. So, you know, when I picked up Edge Protocols, the book, one of the things that struck me when I first started reading it was these are quality teaching practices. These are quality yeah. instructional practices, but they're also kind of presented with a flavor that makes them exciting and in a way that can work in 2022, you know? Well, um, let me, let me explain a toy to you. I got a toy and it's just blocks. You just stack the blocks together. Does that sound exciting? No. No, but if I name it Minecraft, it's a big old party. Yes. Or if I name it Legos, it's yeah. a big old party. It's just blocks, dude. <laughs> if moms were out there telling kids, I want you to play Minecraft tonight and do a good job, they wouldn't play. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, you know, you've heard of inquiry based learning before. Yeah. yeah. Genius Hour makes it that much better, man. You know, like, yeah. like 20 minutes time makes it that much better. Yeah, and that's where I like um, – J.J. Abrams has a really good TED Talk called The Mystery Box. And the whole TED Talk is interesting, but there's about a minute and a half that applies to teaching. And basically he says, when you don't tell people everything they need to know, they become fixated on it. Yes. And so that's why the thing I was just explaining with Gim Kid and Look at the way I did my Latin roots was, that's why we call it the fast and the curious. Because mm. – it sounds kind of fun, like Grand Theft Auto, but not. <laughs> it sounds kind of fun, like The Fast and the Furious, but not. And it's called The Curious because we don't do any direct instruction on the first round. Get in there. Let me see what you've got. Now, some follow-up stories. A friend of mine went on a cruise with me last summer to Alaska, and we spent like three or four dinners and lunches walking her through this. AJ, she walks in. She's in a major district. It's like the fourth biggest district in the state. Her district language arts person walks in and goes, you have 91% accuracy on 61 literary terms, and we've been in school for six days. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. And she says, fast and the curious. And the language arts uh, person goes, so you taught them, and then you did fast and curious. And she goes, no, this is all we did. This is it. Two weeks ago, she followed up with another one. On all eight parts of speech, her class average is 96%. That's sixth graders. And they're using that same technique. Now, that's a super, like I said, it's a gateway level, right? Yeah. It's, there's really sophisticated ones. There's two that I don't even know how to do. <laughs> too fancy. Yeah. So there's a spectrum of really fancy things. But do I have to be able to build every Lego to enjoy my Legos? So that's the other thing that's nice. It's you can settle in at a level that works for you. So hopefully that just uh, kind of gives people clarity. Think about it like a lesson plan that you can use over and over again with um, new content, but the student knows what success looks like. And you mentioned that, you know, there's sophistication. Marlena, my co-author, has a lot of experience with Kagan. Yeah. Um, I've spent years working on Marzano type strategies. And here's the problem with all of those framework type of things like that. 
So there's here's Hattie's 256. We've known about Hattie's 256 for 20 years, but we don't know how to put them into play. Right. We know the names. So I'm going to move from Hattie to Marzano. We know that Marzano's top nine includes similarities and differences. Right. But here's one for you. Non-linguistic representation. <laughs> How do I teach that? Right. Right. Well, and so like an actual practice, not just. If I, if, yes. Yeah. It's not enough to say, can you imagine me? I'm at your staff meeting. You're my first year teacher. Folks uh, use a lot of uh, non-linguistic representations. And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, dude. But I have a bunch of these worksheets for TPT. Is that good? Yeah. So. In protocols, uh, again, my co-author Marlena came up with this one. It's called Sketch and Tell. And what we do is we put kids in a Google slide and we tell them, we just learned how to make Adobe bricks for a, a, a Spanish mission. We just watched this cute little video. Explain how the bricks are made. Oh. And you do that with just the drawing tools in Google Slides. You can't use JPEGs or screenshots. And so you have to, oh, well, I have to make a mold and I have to make a little pile of mud and let make a little pile of, of hay. And then I got a pile of them mixed together and then I've got them in the mold. So I got to do all those things visually. Then after a few minutes, we have all the kids explain their drawing to a table partner. And we give them about three minutes to talk about what they made. Then, because my, my friend Jacob Carr has got me saying this a lot. If, if I can't say it in my head, I'm not gonna be able to write it. Yep. It's true. So they, they have now talked through, oh, and this is this and that's that. They may have gotten some feedback. Oh, I can't tell what that is. Right. So I need to add clarity. So then on the tell side, the kids write in all the instructions for making Adobe bricks. Wow. And, it, and it's super simple. But guess what I got going on there? I got Hattie and Marzano exploding. I've got non-linguistic representation. I've got similarities and differences. I've got summarizing. I've got note taking. I've got collaboration. I've got um, a reciprocal learning. I've got all that packed into just this single little thing that kids love to do. And if, if somebody's wanting to hear, uh, see what that looks like, you just hop over to Twitter and go hashtag sketch and tell. And you'll see second graders doing it and AP students because just like a Venn diagram, there's not a lower limit and there's not an upper limit. It's so it's so fascinating to me because I'm hearing you talk about it and we're, we're going to do like give me 10 in like two minutes in a, in a minute here because I, I want to hear just what that looks like to give some people some examples. But uh -huh. the, the thing that struck me and maybe it's your purple background right now um, is Seth Godin wrote a book <laughs> called uh, Purple Cow. I don't know if you ever read the book Purple Cow. I did not. I'm a big fan though. It's an advertising book. And uh, it basically comes from the premise of he was traveling through France with his family and none of his driving by. It just, like, it just wasn't interesting. And he said, oh, look, there's a purple cow. Everybody looked. And it just, to me, it's fascinating to see a lot of your work because edu protocols are the thing that makes kids pay attention to the actual mm -hmm. learning process and then they find that they're engaged and committed, but they don't get there unless they're paying attention. I feel like right. right now in this moment, it's one of the biggest battles we're all facing in education is right. how to get kids to pay attention. It, it literally is, is the thing that well, I think people are struggling with, right? I've got an add on to that. I see this a lot. The students are engaged. The students are engaged. The students are engaged. Yeah. And I think we're doing that backwards. I think, I don't think we engage them as much as we stop disengaging them. Hmm. I'll give you an example. So last year I visited 185 classrooms. One of the classrooms that I did a demo in, the first graders were following me around with their math prep. Look at mine, look at mine. And they were following me around the classroom like minions. And look at mine, look at mine. And I looked over at the teacher and I go, what you want to tell them is to sit down and take turns, but don't do that because I know what that looks like in sixth grade. And they've been being told for six years to sit down and be quiet. And by year five, they're like, you want it? You got it. I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna be quiet. And you guys have been telling me to do this for five years, which is half my life. Yeah. Yes, I'm gonna do it. And then the seventh grade teachers go to the lunchroom and they're like, these kids are apathetic. And we don't understand 
how we're impacting each other that way. Learning is always a celebration. Like I want kids to be excited about uh, making a decision or drawing a thing or realizing a thing. But what we're always telling them is be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. AJ, I went to 10 classrooms this year. I did 10 45 minute um, push-ins in, in these classrooms. I don't even introduce myself. I do this right here. There's a game. Start playing. Yeah. And they start. Like we're, 15, we're 15 minutes in and kids are like, what's your name? And I go, I'm oh, Mr. C. And then I keep walking. And I'm just going around and I'm checking. And I show the teacher. I go, look, I can see who's doing well and who's doing poorly. Watch this. Uh, Steve-O, you're number one. Do you think you could play it any faster? And he's like, yeah. So he goes faster. Then I go, but look at the data is telling me that these kids are struggling. And this is a true story. Last week, we're doing this um, thing in wordwall.net. And I'm watching the data. We're doing, and think about this for sixth graders. It's a fraction and decimal number line. Okay. It's fractions and decimals and there's no zero you got to put your own zero uh -huh. so a bunch of kids on the first round put the zero all the way to the left because that's where zero goes and then they found out oh the zero floats so one kid uh alex is not doing as well as everybody else over and over again so i go over and i go bro you got to look in the decimals. You got to look at the first and the last number. He was only looking at the 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. I go, bro, slow it down. You got to look at the first and then the second number. Literally, I'm not making this up. Within two minutes, he's doing this thing. You know the chest beat? Yeah. He's in third place. He's in third place. That's he's tearing nice. it up. So that's part of the he's that's part of the protocol's mindset is preventing consistent failure. If that would have been a worksheet, Alex would have done it once. He would have got an F. He would have known he didn't hadn't done well. He would have had to wait until Monday or Tuesday for that to show up in the grade book. And he would have no idea how to remediate that problem. It, by just sitting with him for 30 seconds and just watching him, I go, bro, I can't tell you how many times I've been doing number lines. The two lowest scores on the kids is they're doing the highest a number, lowest number backwards. So everybody has a perfect score, but these three kids, and I go, you have the high and low backwards. They go, what? I go, the high and low are backwards. They flip them. Within three rounds, they're in the top three. That's what a coach does. Right. A, a, a teacher just says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. You should have listened when we were talking earlier. The teacher says, oh, well, it wouldn't be appropriate if I helped them because then how would I put that grade in the grade book? In protocols, we're going to do that same number line tomorrow, AJ, and I'm not going to help them. And guess what's going to happen? They're going to get an A really fast. Right. It's, it's the, the difference is that you're facilitating mm -hmm. learning that mm -hmm. happens through doing instead of yep. learning that it's just happens. It's experiential. You know, right. it's experiential yes. it, and, and, and you get to experience it over and over again and improve. So over I'll, I'll tell you about another student that I had two years ago who uh, I will call Jay. So at the beginning of the year, Jay was not tall, not fast, not cool, not athletic, not super smart. Like he was just hanging out in the class. Kids liked him, but he was just kind of one of those kids who was just there. Just hanging in my class, we start making slides and I start showing them how to do Google Slides, really cool tricks like word art and animations, and mm -hmm. how to use the art tools. It turns out that Jay has a wicked latent art skill that he didn't know he had. And Jay gets so good at doing presentations that when he's presenting, nobody talks. The kids are like glued to the screen. When they go to recess after Jay does a presentation, because remember my class, we present about four times a day, a day. When he's done presenting, they're chasing him to the playground. How did you put the gradient font? How'd you do the rainbow words? How'd you do the outline? They're asking him all the words. AJ, he went from a 35th percentile in reading math to a 70th percentile in reading math. And here's the cool part. He never sat at a kidney table with me. It was COVID. He couldn't, right. right? 
I didn't do long afternoon tutoring sessions. I didn't call his mom and say, hire the local tutor. Right. I designed really effective work at a high level. I coached him in real time, just like you would a football or tennis player. I coached him in real time until he made less and less errors. And at some point he went like, I got this. I got this. Right. And I didn't have to do a bunch of special stuff. He was doing the same work as everybody else, but with feedback in real time. And once he saw that he could be good at building that stuff, his self-image changed. And within three weeks of his self-image changing, academics went through the roof. It was really crazy to watch in February and March yeah. because October, November, December, he was just kind of around, just kind of vibing. But man, January, February, March, he just went ting, right up through the ceiling. Just shot through that. I mean... Was, that's so, educating the whole child right? right that's not that's not teaching standards and i got bad news for your listeners if teaching standards was going to be a thing scores would be up oh yeah oh yeah scores if, would be up the if getting through the whole book was going to be a thing scores would be up scores, scores would, be. would be up if, if you look at the scores we are basically not growing at all since 1970 you ever get any pushback not when i show them the data the you data ever is back with kids when you first do it because I'll give you an example when I do oh based learning or design thinking or you know genius hour and career based stuff with a lot of kids they're kind of like whoa 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 why yeah. are you changing the game of school on me right now right so there's a group of kids uh, who have perfected the game of school oh yeah and when you make the game of school more work yeah. because we know that PBL is more work they are not having it mm -hmm. um, there is definitely something like one to four percent of kids that would prefer to silently do worksheets mm -hmm. and they will once you get up to the junior high and the high school level they're like i don't want to do it this way and i got, I got bad news for you bro this is the rest of your life yep it is and now you may go to a junior college or college where you get some lecture classes but as soon as you're done with that what i'm showing you is the rest of your life you're going to wake up. Your boss is going to email you about some project that you had no idea about yesterday. Yeah. You're going to have to teach yourself new vocabulary. You're going to have to summarize what you learned on the fly. You're going to have to make a video or a PowerPoint or make a t-shirt design for what you need to do. Yeah. Bro, this is the rest of your life. I got bad news for you. There are no companies where you do worksheets, not even the IRS. You, you are going to have to think and work in teams for the rest of your life. And the number one thing in the research I've seen, the number one thing that gets people released, to say it in a kind way, is their interpersonal relations. That's the number one thing. More than incompetence oh, yeah. is being the crazy person on the team. That will get you voted off the island. So, um, so far, I've done pretty well with that. At the school we were at, we would just tell kids, there are four normal high schools around here. If you want to go to the normal high school, I'm, I'll give you a ride. It's no hard feelings. Go for it. But what you're going to find is that is not going to get you anywhere after school. Right. Nobody wants to play t-ball for the rest of their life. At the bare minimum, they want slow pitch. Yeah. yeah yes. You're basically asking to do t-ball for the rest of your high school career and do less work. I'm not going to lower our school standards for that. If you want to go there, not a problem. Like I get it, but it's not, it's just not real. What was funny was probably 25 to 40% of the kids that left were back two weeks later, three weeks later. And they're like, Oh my God, I couldn't stand it. I was dying. I was dying. Wow. I couldn't yeah. stay awake. Well, I mean, and some left and never came shift. back. Yeah. Once you see that shift and you really start thinking about, yeah. How, how do I want, you know, my education to be? How, um, what am I learning, right? Yeah. Or here's another example I use for kids. Uh, when I tell you you're going to take a university level English class, when I say that to an 11th grader, they're like, they freak out. When I tell a 40 year old that, they're like, oh my God, that would be so easy. Perspective is everything. Yeah. Perspective is everything. If I can think and summarize and collaborate, you can't stop me. There is no class. Well, nuclear fusion, uh, <laughs> there's some classes, but most of your classes are gonna be very doable, very doable. 
And it's such a powerful technique. And I, I actually took a couple of my sophomores from that school. They said, okay, Crippo, I love this school. I love all the PBL. I love the no workbooks thing, but is this getting me ready for college? And I go, let's go. Let's yeah. go to college. Yeah. Let's go to college. So I lined up four classroom visits and we went to an, an upper division journalism class, an upper division uh, English class, an upper division business class, and an upper division genetics class. Literally in every class, 10 minutes in, the kid looks over and he goes, is this it? I go, yeah, this is it. <laughs> I could do this right now. I go, I know. Yes, it's just college, bro. Don't listen to the people that try to make it into this big ivory tower. Like you got to read your chapters. You got to read your chapters. But it's not a mystical thing. If you're a learner. Yeah. And, if you're a and learner. if you can engage the teacher and you can take notes and you can tell people what you think in ways that make sense, you're unstoppable. And you're never going to get that from sitting quietly all day and filling in scan prompts. You're just not going to get it from that. I love that perspective. So if someone's listening to this right now and they're like, all right, I'm, I'm digging this edge protocol stuff. Um, I want you to hit them. I'm going to give you like two minutes on the clock. Let me let, hit them with just as many as, as you can just think through what it's called, what the process okay. is. Um, I'm just, you know, you told me, you told you me put a time, you're going to put a timer up on screen for me. I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna put a timer up on the screen right now and pull up time. Okay. All right. Uh, time o'clock. Set up a timer. I'm ready. I'm ready when you're ready. I'm just going to pull up Google Timer here. All right. We're going to go. We'll, we'll give you three minutes. Is that all right? Three minutes is plenty. Okay. All right. I'll put it up as soon as uh, you get started. Here we go. Three minutes. You're up. Ready? Ready, go. Okay, so we've got uh, the first one that's really fun is thin slides. One picture, one word, and three minutes. You give the kids three minutes. Each kid builds one slide. Towards today, AJ, parallel. Who wants that lecture on parallel? Literally nobody. Right. But imagine 30 kids putting pictures of parallel up, and then they have to make a claim or share their reasoning. What's my prep time? Boom. And I can do this every day. Tomorrow when they come in, supplemental angles, go. When they come the next day, complementary angles, go. Perpendicular. So you can work your way through uh, vocab really quickly that way. Another good one. You've heard of Think, Pair, Share? Oh, yeah. We do cy Cyber Sandwich. Marlena's version is called Cyber Sandwich. And it goes like this. You give kids five slides, five slides. On the first slide, AJ's reading something. On the second slide, John's reading something. We each take notes on our own slides, right? So we've got notes now. On the third slide, we compare our notes. Boom, that's like four Marzanos. Yeah. The, yes. teaching, the teaching occurs, I am silent pretty much until everybody's Venn diagram is done. And then I say, group three, what are your three most important facts? Group four, what are your three most important facts? Now we're, we're making sure everything is good. We wrap that up with a paragraph. The paragraph can be summary, response to literature. That paragraph can be anything I want. First person, third person, anything. Um, you've heard of jigsaws, right, AJ? A, a jigsaw? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a jigsaw's a 1.2 on Hattie's list. Not that I memorized that, but that's equal to three years of growth if you're an effective jigsaw. -er. My friend J uh, Jay was an effective jigsaw. -er. So we do an Iron Chef lesson. Five kids in a group. Let's say we're doing literary devices, AJ. Your irony, he's subplot, she's poetic justice. That one's a uh, paradox, and the other one is, uh, let's go, alliteration. Yeah. So in teams of five, each kid does one Google slide. Now, here's what's cool. If one kid screws up their one slide, it doesn't hurt everybody but the one kid, right? So five kids, five slides. Each one has a subject. Give me three facts, definition, and a picture. Boom. What's my planning time? What's my grading time? Ten minutes to build, lots of ACDC, and then two minutes to present. I'm not grading anything tonight because it's pass fail. Last one. Number mania. In the old days, I would give kids 30 things about the gold rush. I would say, I'll see you in three weeks. They would all do it the night before. Now we do number mania. Watch this, AJ. It's wickedly cool. A Google form goes out. Your name, your fact, your number. We're doing Pearl Harbor. AJ does December 7, 1941. John does USS Arizona, 1100 guys. Those all dump into a spreadsheet. 
And then the kids grab five facts and they build a slide, one slide each. And I preloaded all the graphics they need from the noun project because we don't got time to look for the perfect slide right. under 30 minutes and bam. Got it. All right. That was impressive. <laughs> all right. That was, that was impressive. We got thin slide, cyber sandwich, iron chef, and number mania out of Just that. Just like that. Three minutes and uh, yeah. explained pretty well, you know, as well. You've talked about Fast and the Curious uh, in here as well and some other ones. John, where can people learn more about Edge Protocols? You made them open source, which is an amazing, yeah. amazing thing that you've done for educators. What does that look like if someone wants to learn more and, and get started with this process? The shortest answer is uh, three things. One is you can go to edgeprotocols.com, amazingly. <laughs> and there are there are free templates there. And you have to, we ask for your email address so we can stay in touch with you, but there's no charge. And so there's about 12 protocol templates there with examples and all those. Uh, the second cool place is social media. If you just look up hashtag edge of protocols, you'll just see an on running chatter. Mm -hmm. um, but we're starting to get bigger on TikTok. Um, Jacob Carr and Josie Wozniak give some of the best explanations of protocols and examples and exemplars, really, really fun. So that's the second one is Twitter and TikTok. And then the third one is on Facebook, there's a group called Empowered Adventure with an E on both ones. It's a private Facebook group. And in one year, it's grown from two teachers to 6,800. Wow. And what's amazing about that group, and you should join it, AJ, it's amazing because people will literally go, they'll go like this, it's Sunday night. I got moved to fourth grade starting tomorrow. I need something. And right. it's like, boom, boom, boom. Oh, I got a thing. I got a thing. I got a thing. About an hour later, somebody's like, oh, we're doing uh, this thing in history next week. And I'm stumped. Boom, 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 boom. Um, the people that are in there have spontaneously calling it the happiest place on the internet. That is and um, it's really cool to see all that. It's almost like what you would see if we were uh, in a beer brewing club. I need some ideas for IPAs. Boom, boom, boom. It's like how do you use Twitter. Nitro? Sounds yeah, like how do you old use Twitter. Nitro? Let's go. Yeah, it's like old Twitter almost. It's like yeah. old Twitter. Yes. Old Twitter. I love that. Yeah, because Twitter's different now. I mean, it's still good, but it's different. It is. But old um, Twitter was was like that. There wasn't yeah. as it was a smaller community and, and people wanted to respond right away and, and give all yeah. kinds of ideas. It's more yeah. personal. Um, and then there's the five books, which I'm not here to sell anybody books. Uh, so if you're really poor teacher down on your luck, having a bad day, you send me an email, I'll send you a free book. Oh uh, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, there's a limit on that. I'm not going to send 400. You got to, <laughs> yeah, right, right. So yeah. like I had, I had a friend like three weeks ago and she's like, Oh, my house burned down and I lost all my protocol books. I'm like, you got five coming. Shut yeah. up. They're coming. And I'm going to sign them. You're yeah. good. And I love giving the books away because it's like, man, could you have a better psychic payoff than making a classroom happy and yeah. then making a teacher happy? And uh, as we're starting to wrap up, AJ, one of the most amazing things to me is a lot of the teachers you'll see that are really active, not all, but it's a surprisingly large chunk of them have been teaching for 20 years. And they're literally messaging us saying, I was doing it wrong in the first 19 years, and now I get it. I had a teacher that did the random emoji power paragraph with her kids for the first time, and she literally said, I have been teaching writing incorrectly, underappreciating my kids' abilities for 20 years, and I'm never doing that again. I get it now. Like, that's a pretty good pretty good human payoff like i feel like the dalai lama sometimes like <laughs> just get those good vibes going well i mean if you think about it right and we were talking about this a little bit earlier you know, you're doing this because you saw it work in your own classroom mm -hmm. and you saw right. it work as administrator you saw it work in other classrooms so then you're like oh it's not just me or it's, it's not, not just me or it's not just yeah. the school or it's not just this curriculum or this state or anything you start seeing it mm -hmm. work in all different types of situations and you're like well more people need to need to check this out now you know? yeah well and none of we haven't had time to do research on the protocols but all the underpinnings 
um, collaboration, reciprocal teaching. It, they're an amalgamation of all of those things, right? So um, it's really powerful. I would say right now that uh, edge protocols are like a scientific phenomena. If you, you know, phenomena is cool. We don't know, like we don't know exactly why magnets work, but they act in a predictable way, right? right? And so I would put edge protocols strongly as like an educational phenomenon. It works every time. Uh, I haven't had time to put on a lab coat and like do scientific human studies, but I can tell you a lot of it has to do with immediate feedback, yeah. ability to grow, a uh, sense of ownership, a sense of creativity. I mean, those are just things that are germane to the human experience. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, I don't have like Harvard level research, but We've got people doing this in India. We've got people doing this in Mexico. I was in Mexico two weeks ago. The kids there respond exactly the way the kids have did in the U.S. It's just really crazy cool to see how replicable it is. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you, I I love hearing your stories. I love hearing the examples. Um, for those folks that don't know about edge protocols, uh, what John shared, some of those resources, I think are going to blow your mind a little bit, mostly because you can go on that website and do some tomorrow. And, yeah. and to me, and it may not be perfect, you know, you're going to try it, but you're going to get better at it. And you can, but, but we even, we even have a plan for that, which is based on cognitive load theory. This is a scientific approach that is a phenomenon that works. We always do the first protocol. So like if number mania or iron chef sounds great, the first one is going to be on the history of Nike the history of White Castle, the history of Arby's, right. Colonel Sanders, super low floor, high engagement. And that way we can work out the kinks yep. because we're going to do this once a week for 36 weeks. We don't have to get it all perfect. Like here's another, just one more analogy, AJ. Look how far football players move from week one to week 12. Yes. Yeah. Would you agree? Coaching a team right now. I'm coaching my son's team. It's unbelievable. We don't have any sense of that in teaching. And in teaching, we've got them from week one to week 36. Right. Look how much a football team grows in three weeks. How can we bring that kind of growth to our classroom? And we're not going to do it with better worksheets. We had already solved that. Yeah. And we're not going to do it with more engaging lecture. And we're not going to do it by adding video. Because right. none of those things are the right sauce. What matters is human connection, fast feedback, safe place to fail. And I don't have to do research to know those are going to work, right? Those are, those are how good teams work in any sport. So I would encourage people to look at themselves less like a teacher. A teacher tends to be a deliverer of content. Mm -hmm. And a coach is a person who helps you get to a place that you can't go by yourself. Yeah, no, I, I like calling it, you know, we've, we use that term guide on the side. I like calling it guide on the ride. You're long for the learning. Yeah. Journey. You're right, you're yeah. right there. You're long for the learning journey. All right, I like that. Then you go with that one final question, which yes. is we already got where to go and how to connect and all that kind of stuff. Final question, how do we do this type of thing for grading and assessment? What would that look like? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So projects. Uh, this was one of those Friday night scaries. It was Friday. I had all these Egypt projects to grade. And I said, come on, Jimmy Neutron brain. I need an idea right now because I don't want to spend the weekend grading this. And so, okay. So here's, here's how protocols work. Though. I'm going to take classic things and combine them in a new way, you know, uh, the first time you had an Oreo cookie, you're like, wait, that's just frosting and chocolate cookies. But together, it's a whole new thing, right? So I took a, I like the idea of gallery walks. But as a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teacher, I know for sure that nothing good is going to be happening in the conversations. Uh, it looks good, but there's no trackable, traceable learning. So watch what I did. I took a gallery walk and I matched it up with a Google form. Hmm. So when the kids come in on Monday, all the projects are up around the room in groups of four, four people in a group, four projects in a group. And I said, you each need to visit. I don't care which two, but you need to visit each two. And in the Google form, it's going to go like this project number because no names. 
And then it's going to go, if I was going to buy this poster in a store, one through 10. Uh The research on this poster compared to mine, one through 10. The writing on this one compared to mine. So I gave them three Likerts, one through 10. Mm -hmm. And then I gave them something I would change, not something I would fix, because that implies badness. I don't want to go there. Something I would change and something that I like. And I sat back and watched my kids engage in academic discussion guided by the Google form. I got 145 grades in in 35 minutes. Wow. Then all the Google form dumps to a spreadsheet. So I sorted by poster number, right? And then I did equal sum, added up all the scores. And then I did equal average graded, literally took eight minutes. And so then I screenshotted each score and I Google Classroomed it to each one of the kids. And this is the part that blew my mind. Obviously, the two kids that got an average of two out of 30 uh, learned a lot. They came to my desk and they're like, oh, my God, I get it now. And I go, well, if I give you a couple of afternoons, can you get yours looking like theirs? I'm like, oh, totally. So that was a big win, right? Because the idea is perfect practice, football. You don't just say, well, you're bad at football, so we'll do football tomorrow. You say, no, we got to fix this. Yeah. So we fixed it. But the biggest moment was when the kid literally, when I show teachers his poster, immediately they're like, easy A. A. I can see it immediately. But he came to me and he said that seven out of eight people reported that the blue font was hard to read on black. So he would need to be reprinting his. And that spirit of revision and that conscientiousness is what's going to make him rich someday. (laughs) And I want to, and in the old days, he would have said, there's my A, I'm out. Right. But he didn't care about the A. He knew that people couldn't see what he wanted them to see. So that one, we call that one for the people. And look at what just a simple thing it is. A gallery walk connected with a, a Google form. And you'll love what Stephanie did. She's got her phone in the crack of her Chromebook, you know, like a comic book in the old days. And I see her from across the room and I'm thinking, Stephanie, you should know you're working. I walk over and I go, what's up with the phone? She has taken pictures of all of hers. She wanted to work at her desk. So she's got her phone right there in the crack of her Chromebook using it for notes. And I'm like, oh my God, you just got a double A for being a conscientious, thoughtful, creative worker. If I had an employee someday, that's who I would want working for me. These right. kids like that. So I really played that up. So that's for the people. That's the grading protocol for projects that will make no, like no more milk crates full of binders or, you yeah. know, big Ikea bags full of posters going home. I just, as soon as we were done, and then I followed up two weeks later, we finished our Minecraft um, mission to Mars. And I did the same thing. I was like, oh my God. I told them to put eight elements on each mission. That's uh, eight times 30 kids is 200. I'm not grading 240 elements in Minecraft. That sounds like nine or 10 weekends. So I just said, guys, we're going to go like this. And each one of the sharers could share their three favorite modules. So they could share three of their Mm -hmm. eight modules. They didn't have to share all eight. So they got feedback on the three. And I made it so that it was technical. Like, what are three things about their module that you like? Uh, it was just, it just, the kids were great. And then they were just so chill and they enjoyed sharing with each other and being social, which is what sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are doing. But I gave them a way to be academically social. And it was really cool. I think, and I think that is a lot of the keys that I see with Edu Protocols. It's human, it's social, it's meaning centered, it's language based in multiple different kind of ways to use language. And, you know, for anybody watching or listening, um, or someone who's going to read an article on this, I would just say it's worth a try. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe you're jacked up about it and you want to try it. Maybe you've, <laughs> you've done a couple and you want to jump back in, or maybe you're kind of like, ah, I don't really know. It's worth a try. It's worth a try. And if you didn't like anything so far, remember, there's dramatically less grading and planning. Right. <laughs> right. I grew my math class from 9% to 41% passing in one year and did very little 
like no grading after hours on math and only some grading during my contract time and more than well basically quadrupled the score so if that sounds interesting to people that's a whole other reason to try like dramatic growth with way less work yeah so many so many good things about this john your story is inspiring it's awesome i can't wait to see what you do next traveling all around sharing the goodness of edge protocols and i'm hoping that this podcast and this conversation uh, goes far because i really believe in the work that you're doing well with, i'll be sharing it all i can because i had a great time chatting with you well thanks so much for being on the podcast everybody you'll be able to check out the show notes over at ajgiuliani.com slash podcast uh, we'll be having any types of links um, i'll be having john's email so you can email him for all the free books uh, his link to Twitter and all those good things that you got uh, to connect with him. Thanks so much, John, again, for being on the podcast. Thank you, boss. It was great to hang out with you.